Flags over Texas. Six flags over Texas. Hello everyone, this is Bryant with SFOTSource.com, your premier guide to Six Flags Over Texas. The long-awaited final episode of our Decade in Review series is finally here. This time, we take it all the way back to where the development of Six Flags Over Texas began. As seen through the other episodes in this series, Six Flags as a whole has undergone wild transformations growing pains, constant business model changes, and a plethora of different owners. Six Flags Over Texas has not been immune to the ever-moving directions of the company. The 1960s, however, take us back to the original concepts of the park, the original vision that would become the first Six Flags. We travel back in time, pre-1961, to learn about the planning development, and construction of the park. In 1959, planning and design of Six Flags Over Texas begins, headed by real estate entrepreneur and businessman Angus G. Wynn Jr. Angus was initially inspired to build a theme park after a visit to Disneyland four years earlier. This concept, however, was designed to have this type of attraction closer to home and with a Texas twist. The Great Southwest Corporation, along with investors from New York, began the planning and design process. Construction on the park begins in August of 1960, with the target opening date set for July 1961. 205 acres of land in Arlington, Texas are purchased for the project. 35 of those acres are intended for use of the main park layout, while the remaining acreage would be used for parking, offices, maintenance, and other aspects of park support. In December of 1960, the press is given a construction tour. Prior to December, the theme park was set to be named Great Southwestland. During the tour, however, it was stated that the park would open as Texas Under Six Flags. In April of 1961, the name of the park is changed once more and set to Six Flags Over Texas. Six Flags Over Texas soft opens August 1st through 4th with an official opening date of August 5th. The park is designed to depict the six sovereigns that had ruled over Texas throughout time. Unveiling a well-rounded park was important to Angus Wynn. Several rides were designed to replicate authentic experiences depending on their location in the park. Shops and dining locations also followed the formula featuring themed foods and souvenir offerings. Each park area also featured themed street performances and in-depth landscaping. Opening day attendance is recorded at 8,374 people. Admission is $2.75 for adults and $2.25 for children. Hamburgers are $0.35, cents, soft drinks are $0.10, cents, and parking is $0.50. Cents. Minimum employee age during the park's opening season is 21 years old. The six themed areas of Six Flags Over Texas include Spain, France, Mexico, Texas, the Confederacy, and USA, which back then was referred to as modern. Located at the front gate were the Dancing Waters and the Star Mall. The Dancing Waters existed up until recently. Entertainment commonly found here was the Six Flags Over Texas Marching Band. 
In the modern park area, guests would find the Southwest Life Petting Zoo, the Missile Chaser, a single track happy motoring freeway, one of two Astrolift stations, and Sidewinder, a wild mouse roller coaster. Exhibit halls, which were commonly upcharge attractions that featured educational content, were also located in modern. In France, the primary attraction is La Salle's River Adventure, which took guests on an interactive journey through various scenes. In the Confederacy, you'd find the Amphitheater, which would present a variety show its opening year, along with the Little Dixie Carousel, the Dixieland Band, Confederate reenactments, and the ever-so-popular Naylor's Chicken Plantation Restaurant. Guests could climb aboard the Overland Butterfield Stagecoach for an authentic horse-drawn experience. You could also find Mrs. Goff's Ice Cream, Leonard's, Miss Abigail's, and the Highland Historical Press. All of these buildings still stand in the park today. It is important to note that when the park opened, the concept of the areas was to be for educational purposes and not the glorification of controversial subjects. Also located on the edge of the Confederacy is Skull Island. This attraction featured the Skull Rock Slide, Raft Slides, a Tree Slide, and other interactive elements. In Texas, guests would find the Six Flags Railroad, the second Astrolift Station, and the Crazy Horse Saloon performance venue. Gunfighter performances were also a common occasion in the area. Dining and shopping offerings included the Depot Cafe, Jeans Western Wear, and Mrs. Bowie's Candy Shop. At the border of the Texas and Mexico Park sections sat the Indian Village and Trading Post and its highlight of Native American dances and presentations. This attraction was centered around Native Americans and their place in Texas history. In Spain, Los Conquistadores Coronado Borough Ride is the main attraction. Heading into Mexico, we have Las Cocheses Cabras Goat Cart Ride, the original Fiesta Train, and live mariachi music as entertainment. The area was also home to Banderas de Colores, or the covered walkway, along with La Terraza Refresh Stand, an El Chico restaurant, and Casa de Regalos. Helicopter rides, believe it or not, were also offered just outside of the park. The first season only spanned 45 days and ended on November 25th with a total of 550,000 visitors. The park's second season begins on April 20th, 1962. Ticket prices are set at $2 for adults and $1.75 for children 12 and under. The park also employs 1,000 team members. Several new attractions make their way to Six Flags Over Texas. The Chaparral Antique Cars, created by Aero Development, are added to the park's Texas section. Sidewinder, the park's only roller coaster, is relocated to the Mexico section and renamed La Cucaracha. This makes way for a second track to be added to the Happy Motoring Freeway car attraction. The Caddo War Canoes also make their debut, themed to represent the Caddo Native American tribe. Skull Island sees an expansion with the addition of a pirate ship, barrel slide, and more. Casa Magnetica, a Crooked House attraction, also makes its debut. This guided tour takes guests on an adventure that defies gravity. The Six Flags Railroad sees the addition of the Red Train. In the amphitheater, the Six Flags Campus Review plays. The massive production features a full orchestra, 26 performers, and lasts almost an hour. At the end of the season, Los Conquistadores Borough Ride is removed. The end of year attendance is recorded at 1.2 million visitors. It's time to join your friends for a day of fun at Six Flags Over Texas. Here's the Six Flags band to escort you to some of the favorite rides, attractions, and shows. Like a trip on the Six Flags train, where you can go around the park or stop at the new station in Boomtown. Then wind down the road of yesterday in a chaparral. 
rest for a while and enjoy a show at the Crazy Horse. Stroll through the streets of Texas history while events take place all around you. There's something for every member of the family in the six big sections at Six Flags. One price ticket covers admission to the park and all rides, attractions, and featured shows. You'll want to visit Boomtown, a brand new area with a thrilling sky hook and delightful carousel. Six Flags Over Texas, the showplace of the Southwest and the Dallas-Fort Worth Turnpike. Opens at 10 a.m. every Saturday and Sunday. Plan your Six Flags day now. Six Flags Over Texas doesn't show signs of slowing down as the 1963 season takes shape. Tickets for adults are set at $3.50, while children admission is $2.50. Two major additions come to the park in 1963 with a first-of-its-kind attraction and a brand new park area. El Aceradero, an aero development log flume attraction, debuts within the former layout of Los Conquistadores Coronado Burrow Ride. With a drop height of 44 feet and max speed of 15 miles per hour, the popular El Aceradero takes claim as the world's first ever log ride. Boomtown is introduced as the park's seventh themed area. A size of six acres, the area's concept was to replicate a turn-of-the-century oil town in Texas, also acting as a historical add-on to the park's modern section. With the addition of Boomtown also came brand new attractions. This included the Antique Carousel, which has a history spanning back to its construction in 1928. From 1928 to 1937, and then 1945 to 1962, the carousel operated at Rockaway's Playland Amusement Park. Featuring 66 hand-carved horses and two chariots, the Denzel Carousel was purchased by Six Flags Over Texas for $25,000. Today, the carousel is valued at over $5 million. The second primary attraction in Boomtown was the Skyhook. The Skyhook was a cargo crane originally constructed in 1910 that was converted into an observation ride by Six Flags Over Texas. Guests would ascend 155 feet in a basket to experience breathtaking views of the park and surrounding areas. With the addition of Boomtown, the park would shorten track one of Happy Motoring Freeway. 1963 also saw the addition of the Jersey Lily, a replica of Judge Roy Bean's saloon in the park's Texas section. Entertainment at the amphitheater included the Gilchrist Glitters Campus Review. 1963 would also mark the final season of Las Cocheses Cabras Goat Cart Ride in Mexico. April 18th marks the beginning of the 1964 season with admission prices remaining unchanged from 1963. The year's major addition is the Cave Dark Ride in the park's Confederacy section. The ambitious project was conceptualized, designed, and overseen by Randall Duell and Angus Wynn. Engineering and construction of the ride's mechanisms would be taken on by Aero Development. Featuring the famous Spelunker character, guests would board a boat and experience a series of theatrical-like scenes. Though a strong storyline didn't exist, these small creatures could be seen carrying out many typical tasks. One scene featured the Spelunkers playing catch with a boulder, while another one would be playing a large pipe organ. Other well-remembered scenes include a storm with plenty of lightning and thunder, along with a scene that featured a large barrel, which rotated, creating a fun optical illusion. Other big changes in 1964 see the addition of a suspension bridge and three swamp slides added to Skull Island, a Mexican bazaar with themed souvenirs added to the former goat cart ride location, the steakhouse taking over the Highland Historical Press in the Confederacy, and the introduction of the Pink Thang ice cream treat. In the amphitheater, the Singing Flags Campus Review is featured. At the end of 1964, La Cucaracha, the park's first roller coaster, is removed. The pirate ship is also removed from Skull Island. 
In Weatherford, Texas, the seat of Parker County, this courthouse was constructed in 1886 at a cost of $55,000. Business transacted here is county law and government. This facade, patterned after the old courthouse, is at Six Flags Over Texas, and business transacted therein is the making of ice. 20 tons of it a day, to be specific. A far cry from horse-drawn ice wagons, these specially made vehicles convey ice throughout the park, chill drinking water, and provide ice for soft drinks, adding to the comfort and pleasure of visitors. This ice house, with its courthouse appearance, stands 83 feet tall and costs considerably more than the Parker County Courthouse. From the clock tower, a beautiful view can be had of the 115-acre family funland. What time is it now? It's time for Six Flags to discontinue daily operation and open only on Saturdays and Sundays throughout the fall. The 1965 season at Six Flags Over Texas began on April 16th. Angus Wynn released 600 balloons, which featured coupons for free park admission inside. At the site of the former La Cucaracha roller coaster, the El Sombrero attraction is introduced. The Chance Rides Trabant is themed to a huge sombrero that spins guests around in circles. The County Fair Arena, also commonly known as the Texas Pavilion and the original Texas Arena, is constructed in the park's Texas section. Holding 2,500 guests, the outdoor arena features the Six Flags Circus its opening year. This is also the first attraction constructed outside of the park's railroad loop. Near the front gate, the clock tower is constructed. The star planter is replaced with five large circular planters. In the Confederacy, the short-lived steakhouse dining location is replaced by Colonel's Cafe. Thank You, Mr. President, a new play with old music, is featured in the amphitheater. At the end of the season, the helicopter rides that are offered just outside of the park discontinue. The 1966 season, which begins on April 15th, is another major year for the park with its next unique addition. Runaway Mine Train, designed by Aerodynamics, is introduced in the park's Boomtown section, opening on July 23rd. Featuring a track length of 2,400 feet and a top speed of 35 miles per hour, the Runaway Mine Train is the world's first ever mine train roller coaster. What else makes the Runaway Mine Train a unique experience? Its final drop, which sends riders through an underwater tunnel, is also its largest. Several new entertainment offerings are also introduced in 1966. Let's Do It is featured in the amphitheater, the Wild West show takes place in the Texas Pavilion, and the park's first version of the Dolphin Show, located near Skull Island, opens in June of that year. New for the fall season at Six Flags Over Texas is the Jet Set, the only one to be found in the United States. This ride, designed in Switzerland, is comprised of a dozen airplanes which respond to controls similar to real aircraft. Guests fly the planes, which are powered by electro-hydraulic systems. The jet set planes ride on vertical steel girders and climb, dive, bank, and spin at the whim of the pilots. The jet set is located on a new two-acre area in the modern USA section of the Family Entertainment Center. Six Flags just entertained its 10 millionth guest and will operate only on weekends after Labor Day until October 29th. The six-year-old park is located midway between Dallas and Fort Worth on the Turnpike. Due to its initial response from visitors, the new and unusual jet set will be a very popular ride during the upcoming fall season. The 1967 season sees the addition of two new attractions at Six Flags over Texas. First up is the Spindle Top, a chance rotor ride, which debuts near the current spot of the Majestic Theater. Guests would enter the ride structure and become stuck to the wall as it spun faster and faster. The second attraction would be Intamin's first ever amusement ride, Jet Set. Added to the modern section, 
Jet Set would allow guests to control their own ride units, rotating, lifting, and dropping them as if they were flying their own plane. Returning for a second season was Let's Do It, which played inside the amphitheater. End of year attendance is reported at 2 million people. Once the 1967 season concluded, the Overland, Butterfield Stagecoach, and the Indian Village were both removed. The trading post, however, would remain. 1968 is another season of big investment with hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on live entertainment. The season began on April 13th and park property at this point has expanded to 140 acres. Park admission is $4.50 for adults and $3.50 for children under 12. The amphitheater would undergo a $200,000 transformation as it is enclosed and reintroduced as the Southern Palace Theater. This marks the beginning of Broadway-style productions at Six Flags Over Texas. The park is also considered a pioneer of review-style productions inside theme parks across the world. For its inaugural season, Southern Palace Theater featured BCTV and the Red, White, and Blue Review. The Red, White, and Blue Review was also distributed in the form of albums. The Croft Puppet Theater, which also comes in at a cost of $200,000 to construct, is opened just outside of the park's modern section. Now currently known as Majestic Theater, the venue featured the works of puppeteers Sid and Marty Croft. The theater's inaugural season featured the show Circus. The addition of the Croft Puppet Theater sees Spindletop relocated near Skull Island. Under the direction of the Croft brothers, the Fiesta Train undergoes major renovations with upgraded animatronics and new larger scenes. A second log flume, also designed and constructed by Aero Development, is added to Ellis Heredero due to the overwhelming popularity of the attraction. The second flume takes over the area once occupied by the Indian Village. Nearby, the Cyclorama Museum of American Indians also opens inside the trading post. At the end of the season, the Skyhook Observation Ride, along with the suspension bridge and three swamp slides on Skull Island, are removed from the park. Skyhook, however, is relocated to the new Six Flags Over Georgia theme park just outside of Atlanta. For the first time in its history, Six Flags Over Texas experiences a decline in attendance recorded at 1.7 million visitors for the year. The 1969 season, our final season of this decade in review, begins on April 12th. Just like before, the park releases balloons during the opening ceremonies that contain coupons for free admission to the park. The 1969 season features more drastic expansion with several new attractions, a new entertainment venue, and a whole new park area. In the Boomtown section is the debut of the Mini Mine Train roller coaster. Built by Aero Development, the Mini Mine Train reaches a height of 20 feet and a top speed of 14 miles per hour. The addition of the Mini Mine Train was intended for guests that weren't quite ready to experience the Runaway Mine Train. The new roller coaster takes over the space once occupied by the Skyhook. The park's next themed area, the Tower section, debuts with the addition of the Oil Derrick Observation Tower. Standing 300 feet tall, the Intamin constructed structure allows riders to take elevators up to multiple observation decks for a view of the park and surrounding areas. Oil Derrick also features the Tower Slides attraction at its 50-foot level. This intense ride had guests barreling down a 12-lane slide on a burlap sack. Nearby, the 1,000-seat Aquatic Theater also opens. The outdoor venue now becomes the home of the park's dolphin show. Rounding out the Tower section is the Fisherman's Wharf dining location and the Blowout gift shop. The Cinesphere Chevy Show is added across from the Cave Dark Ride. The advanced technology gave guests an IMAX-like experience with a video feature playing on a 180-degree curved screen. As it was sponsored by Chevrolet, guests could also commonly find models of their car lineup just outside of the presentation. In the Southern Palace Theater was the show The Fabulous Flickers. 
while the Wild West show performed its final season in the Texas Pavilion. Also in 1969, Angus G. Wynn Jr. sells Six Flags to Limited Partnership. The 1960s at Six Flags Over Texas are filled with the nostalgic attractions, shows, and moments that many park visitors still talk about today. Ironically enough, Six Flags Over Texas was only meant to be a short-term project to fund other business ventures that Angus G. Wynn Jr. was involved with. Though that was the case, an incredible amount of thought and detail, which would ultimately create a well-rounded experience, was still executed. What were your favorite moments from the 1960s? Personally, my answer is twofold. I love that entertainment was held in such high regard for guest experience with so much investment in new venues. I also would have loved to experience people's reactions to so many first-of-its-kind attractions that were unveiled during the decade. Though I don't feel like Six Flags Over Texas made a huge shift until the late 1970s, the company being sold to limited partnership was just the beginning of many sales that landed Six Flags as a whole where it is today. This concludes our Decade in Review series for Six Flags Over Texas. From here, our plan is to unveil more History of Six Flags series episodes when we aren't knee-deep in park visits and updates. What are some topics you'd like to see brought up in the History of Six Flags series? So far, we've covered LaSalle's River Adventure and El Aceradero. We encourage you to watch the other Decade in Review episodes along with the full gambit of Decade in Review episodes that have already released for Six Flags Fiesta Texas. We thank you all for watching, take care, and we'll see you soon at a theme park. Hey!